So as Ben introduced me, a uh, little bit about my background. I've uh, worked, at, I started off writing code for the core indexing team at DB2LUW and uh, for a variety of projects, uh, pure XML range partitioning uh, for the data partitioning feature, and then moved to MarkLogic and now Couchbase. The database market has changed quite a bit over the last few years, and it's been very exciting to see emerging technologies come up and be a part of that. So I'm very excited to be here and talk about a different approach to solving data management. So a quick overview of the presentation. Uh, we'll take a look at why transition at all. Uh, relational databases have been around for a while and have a huge ecosystem around them. So why are people looking at these new technologies? We'll then specifically talk about distributed document databases and how they solve Two problems. One is the unstructured data problem. With uh, We'll take a look at the data model, uh, comparing relational and document databases, and then take a look at the scalability model and see how we can handle a big audience. Now you'll, see, you'll say a big audience, how does that relate with big data? Is it a new term? Is it, why don't I know about this yet? Well, in some ways it's related. Uh, big data, everyone has their own definition for it. At the core, it is uh, not just about volume, but about variety, complexity of information. Big audiences are, is, the, is the ability to support large number of users. With new applications coming out today, uh, like social media applications, uh, it could be a blog application or a, or a, 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 a quick uh, photography application, instantly you could have millions of users. And so that's really about the big audience problem, which is trying to solve, trying to serve data to potentially mil millions, of, millions of users. We'll take a look at some of the other characteristics, and then if time permits, I'll introduce Couchbase Server, but this is really not uh, an advertisement for Couchbase. This is really to help you understand what document databases are about. In some cases, I'll use Couchbase as an example, perhaps. So why transition at all? You, you have a huge ecosystem around relational databases. You have database tools, you have BI products, ETL, MDM, master data management, metadata. There's this whole world out there. Uh, why are people looking at NoSQL um, as uh, these new emerging technologies come up? To figure out why, let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to when these databases were built. So if you go back to 1970s or 80s, early 80s, you see that a lot of things were different. The number of users were different, the applications were different, the infrastructure was different. Uh, we started off with uh, an application that served 2,000 users was probably one of the largest applications at that point of time, where today we start off with 2,000 users and then potentially grow to 200,000 or 20 million. We've seen some applications, uh, that some customers that we are working with, where you can actually grow to 35 million users in a matter of weeks. And so how do you support this use case? Uh, the, the dynamic user population is the other aspect where you don't have control over users. Users come and go. You don't, uh, you don't have the predictability. You don't know, but you still have to plan for it because if you do have demand, it's a good problem to have and you need a system that handles that demand. Looking at applications, you, have, uh, you, you used to have a lot of automation, applications that were based on automation, that is maybe converting a manual process or a business process uh, into an automa or automated process using a system, versus today it's about innovation. How do you get users to shop differently and socialize and, and entertain themselves? And it's a completely different kind of application that you're trying to build, particularly in the interactive web uh, space, uh, or you could you could you could sort of call it in the OLTP space. This is not on the warehousing side. This is more on the OLTP side of things. And then finally, the infrastructure. It was all about mainframe, centralized computing. Uh, you want to scale up all the way, and networking was in the infancy, uh, and memory was expensive. It was incredibly expensive. And today, on the other hand, one gig E is is norm. 10 gig E is becoming very common, particularly in uh, managed data centers, right? And so you, these, these problems, the, the infrastructure has changed. And so you need a different kind of a database to handle these different user requirements and different application requirements. So we actually conducted a survey late last year 
And we got about uh, 1,300 respondents. We tried to advertise in a bunch of different places. There was something here that surprised us. Now, if you see this, the second most, uh, the second biggest driver for NoSQL is the inability to scale out data. Now, the, given that the user requirements change, the application requirements change, this was not something that was new to us. We were working with a lot of customers uh, where scale was the issue. But turns out the number one driver was actually lack of flexibility, the ability, the inability to iterate over your applications faster, the inability to build, to do rapid application development. And this was the big factor that came up uh, right on the top. Now, we'll see how document databases try to address both these issues. But in general, all NoSQL databases, most NoSQL databases, address these two issues, uh, whether they're key value stores, whether they're document databases, whether they're graph databases, they try to address these two issues. Uh, at Couchbase, given that Couchbase is a document database, we believe that it's, it's the right balance. It gives you the right balance between schema flexibility as well as performance. And so we'll take a look at that into more detail. Before I jump into this, how many of you are familiar with uh, the NoSQL space and the different categories that are out here? All right, so I won't spend too much time talking about this, but what I'd like to say is, this is kind of what the, the categories look like today. So we have on one extreme key value stores, we have uh, data structure databases, document databases, column databases, graph databases, and so on, and, and I'll focus on just that one. But while I don't want to complicate things for you, there's a lot of other options available out there. And we really believe that it's the right database for the right application. So you need to understand your application requirements. See if the, the database that you're looking at is the right choice. Now, Couchbase is a document database. Uh, at the core, every NoSQL database is a key value store. Uh, are people here familiar with a key value store? Otherwise, I'll just uh, maybe spend a little, a little time, a sentence or two talking about it. All right. So key value stores are most basic kind of database where you have a key, which is equivalent to a primary key of your table, and you have a value, a, a value that it points to, and that value is stored as a blob in the database. Right, so it's, it's very, very basic. You have a key and a value. To get access to your value, you use the key, and that's really the only way to get access to it. So you, have, you, do, you can insert data, and you can get data, but it's incredibly fast, right? Because, it's, because you have the key, you know exactly where the data lives, and it's really fast. Document databases build on to that concept. They add indexing and querying capabilities. And that's what you would expect out of a database. Uh, and so that's why we feel that document databases gives you the be best balance between schema flexibility, but being able to do more with the information that you actually have in your database. Uh, Couchbase is, uh, has auto sharding, so it's, uh, it scales horizontally. Uh, we call it clone to grow, where you can add nodes as you go and build the database horizontally as your demand increases. Uh, replication is used for uh, high availability. So if you have node failures within your cluster, you can automatically fail over to the node that, uh, that has a replica of the data. Uh, and it includes an in built-in cache, a caching tier that gives you the, the consistent high throughput and low latency that you would expect for an application with, with millions of users. CouchDB, on the other hand, is a single server database. Uh, it's, uh, it, we, we, uh, we are descendants from Membase and CouchDB. And CouchDB has, it's slightly, it's used, for, it's good for different class of uh, applications. What we took is the, the ability to index and query, and that's what we embed in Couchbase. Uh, MongoDB is another database that is, uh, again, visible and uh, widely adopted like Couchbase. And it's similar in some ways. It supports auto-sharding, uh, slightly different flavor of replication. It uses a master-slave replication. Uh, and it also has support for ad hoc querying. So if, if that is something that you need for your application, then a MongoDB uh, could be a good fit. So let's take a look at distributed document databases. And, and by distributed, I mean that it's a database that can be spread horizontally across multiple servers, but to the application, it really looks like one instance or one database. 
at the core, you have um, a document that describes your record or your data or your object. Uh, each each uh, the data is uh, self-describing. So here you see that you have a couple of attributes. You have time, server, um, type, and so on. Each attribute has a value associated with it. And every document in the database could have a completely different schema. So it have, could have a completely different list of attributes. Now, it could get uh, fairly complex. So you could have embedded objects. Um, you have uh, the details attribute here, which actually has a, a, a document embedded within it. And so it allows you to model data uh, very flexibly and model different kinds of data. So particularly for unstructured information, whether it's blogs or, or comments or a tagging application, this is a great way to represent your information because you have so much flexibility with the data model. Now, all, day, all documents are pointed by a unique key. This is the document ID, uh, equivalent to a primary key in a database. And uh, the, the data model to actually store this on disk is, uh, is, could be different. So in some cases, it's JSON. Uh, so JSON is, this is, this is what it would look like. Uh, in some cases, it could be XML. Uh, or derivatives of JSON and XML. A Couchbase, we, uh, we use uh, JSON. MongoDB uses BSON, which is binary JSON. Now, in a key value store, if this is what your data or your value looks like, you won't really be able to query it or look into it. But with a document database, you get indexing and querying capabilities. And so th now you can create secondary indexes on individual attributes like you could in your relational database uh, and then and use those uh, for, for querying purposes. Now you can even have group buys, reduce, and so on. The implementation of indexing uh, could vary from document database to database. Uh, in Couchbase, we use incremental map reduce as a method of building these indexes. Um, in MongoDB, you have indexes that are built right after an insert and an update happens, versus in Couchbase, they're actually built when, when, the, when the index is actually queried. And so there's some behavioral differences depending on the system that you use that you should be aware of. Now, auto sharding is the ability to scale out. So uh, each database uh, implements this slightly differently. With Couchbase, we use consistent hashing. Uh, consistent hashing uh, takes a, a key, it hashes it to some uh, to, to a value, and then w the client the client knows exactly which server that value lives on, and so you can directly go and point to the server to access the information, which is why you have much faster speeds and much low, la low latencies. So that's a brief overview, but now let's take a look at what exactly the data models look like and the scalability models look like and so on. That's probably a schema some of you might be familiar with. Uh, with relational databases being so mature, a lot of existing applications have very complex schemas. Now, NoSQL databases are in fairly early in maturity from a product perspective, and so uh, I'm not here to tell you we can replace that. Uh, I'm here to say that for new kind of applications that are maybe simpler, that are uh, that where where your requirements are very different from what you're used to, NoSQL might be a good option. So let's let's take a look at a very simple comparison. So most of you are familiar that uh, with tables, table definitions, and so on. Uh, here's an example with um, where you have rows and columns. Uh, uh, you define a table with a primary key, perhaps a uh, couple of columns in it. Uh, every row must conform to that table definition. And uh, if you if the comp table gets complex, you use three third normal form. You'll denormalize and denormalize and denormalize. In the end, of end uh, end up with that kind of schema where you have multiple tables uh, and foreign keys that connect all of them. On the document side, the same information can be represented uh, where each record is different. It could look different. Um, and you could store all this, all these documents or records in one database or in one table. And so that's really at the core, the basic difference between the relational data model and a document data model. So here's an example where we have an error log. You're trying to log an error, uh, the errors that, you're, that you encounter across multiple data centers. Uh, in the first table, we have 
primary key, we have uh, maybe the error text, the time that it occurred, and then a, a, a foreign key dependency to the data center's table, uh, which gives you information about which data center it was, what the phone number was, and so on. And so to get, a, get the complete record of a specific error, you would perform a join across the two tables, get your, uh, where the foreign key is equal, and, and then get the information back out. Now, how would you represent this in a document? So here what happens is, um, to make it, the, the first part is pretty simple. You've taken each column and you've created an attribute with it, uh, but you've also included the data center as well as the phone number of the data center in that, uh, in that object. And so you've basically joined the two tables, you've, de you've denormalized it, uh, and you have created this, this record that represents the complete set of information for a specific error. What makes, what, what makes it, what gets easy to do is schema change. Um, if you have to change the, the relational schema, you would probably need, for, for this kind of a change, you'd probably need to add two columns to your table, uh, maybe some additional columns in your data center table. It depends on uh, what, what you're trying to do. But a simple alter table could take weeks or months in some cases to implement. And so you're not being, you're, you're unable to rapidly iterate over your application um, to push things out faster. So, because that's what the market wants. And so with this kind of schema change, it becomes really easy to add additional attributes. As new information becomes available, you can simply add new attributes to your document and continue. So what about modeling these documents? I mean, we have so much theory and uh, so many best practices on the relational side. Uh, it's fairly early on the NoSQL side, but there's a couple of different options, and, and let's take a look at that. It really depends on your application. If you want, do you model these objects as separate objects in your ORM layer? Uh, do these objects get access together? Uh, are, do, what about your, uh, what are your atomicity requirements? Do you, do you need all these objects to be updated at the same time as one atomic operation? Um, or do you have a lot of concurrent users that are, uh, that are updating these documents? A lot of these aspects go into your document modeling. But at the highest level, think of it as representing objects or logical objects at the ORM layer, and that makes it a lot easier. The simplest way is the one that I described earlier, which is all information about a related document uh, object is in one document. Makes it really easy. Uh, but there's issues with that. The issue is that you duplicate a lot of content, right? What about uh, 3, 3NF and, and denormalizing and reducing duplication? Uh, you will see your data sizes increase. Um, what about um, the, um, in, the, in the other option where you have separate documents, uh, you have different kind of problems. Uh, NoSQL databases are pretty early in product maturity, and they don't, they don't have a way of implementing joins. And so if you have them as separate documents, uh, you will have to implement joins at a, at a client level uh, within your application. So your application could get a little more complex. Let's take a look at document ID. So we talked a little bit about it. Uh, this equates to a primary key uh, on the relational side. And this is what's used to actually shard a document across multiple servers. So if you have a distributed database, you need to know where the key lives, where this document lives, so you can directly go and access it without the additional hops. And so that's what's used um, to, uh, to shard data across multiple servers. Uh, this is a way to get information extremely fast because you know exactly where it's located. Uh, and usually the document ID is unique across a bucket. A bucket is equivalent to a table. In some cases it's called a collection. And so just a couple of options here. Won't go too much into it. You have uh, different ways of picking your uh, UIDs. Uh, could have date-based numeric IDs as you do with relational. Uh, in some cases, it might make sense to have human-readable uh, um, IDs to make the application easier. Yeah, question? Uh, it's a unique user ID, which is auto-generated, typically. Yes. You could think of it as a sequence that you might use in a relational database. So let's take an example uh, of uh, maybe an, a blog application, a new kind of application uh, where you have unstructured data because blogs typically don't have structure. Your comments could be five pages long or two lines, and you need to be able to handle that. Uh, 
So at the core, you have a user profile. You have uh, the profile then pro points to blog entries. Uh, you might have uh, other settings like badge settings and so on. Uh, and then you have the blog posts themselves. So the blog post includes text for, for that blog, other information about that blog. And then you have blog comments. So these are kind of the, the three uh, core objects that we want to represent. Option one is have everything in the same document. And so here we have um, a blog post which says title hello world. Uh, you have a you have a body in there and, and so on. Comments is the interesting field there because you have you have a, a, a list of comments in there. So you're basically embedding all the comments into this one document. Now this could get complicated because you could have thousands of comments on a very popular blog post, right? Uh, you don't want all that to be in a single document because it gets more expensive to access this document if it's really large in size. Uh, on the other hand, your application might need you to display only five comments on a page and then move to the next page and next page and so on. And you can't iterate over them if, if everything is together. So that's, that's where option two comes in, where we split out the documents uh, into two different ob doc, uh, uh, objects. The first one is the core blog doc. Uh, which has information about the metadata, you would say, uh, the text as well, and then the comment, uh, where each comment is an individual document, and the comment includes an ID, which you then embed into the blog document. And so in some sense, uh, this is going back to the foreign key concept, where you see you have uh, the, the, blog, the blog doc uh, has a foreign key that points to your comments, and that would be a way to actually getting access to the comments. Now remember that, NoSQL databases, including Couchbase and uh, MongoDB, don't have the ability to do joins yet. And so this is something that you might need to compute at the application level. So with, um, with these new technologies, uh, while you're getting a lot of advantages, there's some things to be, uh, be careful about when you're planning your application. Now using this concept of breaking up, go ahead, question? Well, you keep saying, don't have yet. Yes. <laughs> Right. Uh, it's pretty early to say how it would be implemented, but at the core, what we're seeing is you need a way to reference related content. Right, at, it could be at, at the most basic level, it's one level of indirection, uh, and, and a way to have the database be able to understand that that link. Uh, Do you believe it'll be self-referential? I think it would it would depend. Uh, what we've seen is a lot of documents uh, might be in a single table or a single bucket or a collection, which means that you need a self-join, right? Because you have different different objects that are stored in the same table. Uh, in some cases, people prefer to have multiple collections or buckets and, and you need joins across buckets. So it would be, it might we might need both, but this is probably something we're talking about two years down, maybe a year and a half down, two years down the line. But we've definitely seen that it's many applications, the, there is a need for it. A lightweight join is probably the first thing that would be implemented. And, and do, uh, does the support, like, a no, not yet. I think a lot of answers will be not yet <laughs> because it's uh, it's these products are have been in the market for two two three years right that's right that's right yes uh, but again that's something that comes up and we're we're seeing what the best way to integrate full text is so if you take the concept of splitting out you can go into uh, for fairly complex document models uh, like you have with relational uh, but uh, the, the and the advantages are if you have all the information in one location it's easy to get everything together it's almost like a pre-computed join in one in one location uh, versus uh, having some complex application logic in your app 
So given, given these advantages and disadvantages, do you think, how do you know if NoSQL and document databases is the right approach for you? Uh, what we've seen is uh, there, there, there are several questions that might help answer this. So have you changed the way that you're using a, your database, your relational database? Um, are, are you just serializing your objects and storing them as key and value? Then, then perhaps yes. Uh, do you have a lot of sparse tables where not all the records really need or have all the information for all the columns? Um, that, that's one one of the uh, one of the things where we've seen NoSQL might help. If you the other one is your application changes. If your application changes really fast, you might want to consider NoSQL schema list and it's uh, get, get the flexibility uh, of these databases so that you can iterate faster and push out more changes to your application. And finally, at, at the extreme, are you just using your relational database as a key value store, uh, in which case you're not getting the advantages of relational database, you're not getting the advantages of NoSQL, and so you might want to think of a different approach. So before moving on to the scaling model, any questions about data model? That's right. It's one of the it's one of the the key key propositions I would say. Uh, with MySQL, typically you need a caching tier on the top, and then that's another thing you're managing. With Couchbase, the caching tier is integrated, so you don't really need uh, to manage it. You you have uh, your caches warmed up when your server starts off, and so on. Uh, you don't have a cold cache problems when your node goes down because data is replicated. So there's a lot of management and operations considerations where a solution like Couchbase would significantly help. It makes it incredibly easy to add nodes and rebalance data across, uh, and also to be able to keep your application running. So we, could, we actually can do upgrades, whether it's software upgrades, database upgrades, hardware upgrades, with the application running. So you never need to take your application down. You add new servers, uh, rebalance information out, remove servers, get those out again, rebalance information out, and, and your app is just running all the time. That's right. So the, uh, with Couchbase, the we have the query tier is it uses HTTP APIs, and so it's very different. In some sense, you would have similar. Um, Operate, operators, you have equals and you can do range queries and so on, but it's not, it's not SQL. And so we'll talk a little bit about accessing data and talk about what the issues there are. I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, you, you talk about data model, but mm -hmm. uh, what Right, right. I think it's it, it's easier to think of it in terms of your ORM layer and you to model your objects in terms of uh, in the documents in terms of your objects. But it's it's early to have there aren't tools out there that can help you through that process yet. And so as we move further with more adoption, we'll see that there's more tools out there to kind of guide you through that data modeling process. 
So let's talk about scalability. We talked a little bit about it with auto sharding um, and uh, see how it's different with, with the relational world and with uh, document databases. So here you see that you have a bunch of ap application servers. They sit behind a load, load balancer. This is uh, kind of your typical application. You have um, your database, which is, uh, which is either um, shared everything or a shared cache or a shared disk kind of a system. Uh, and if your demand grows, if the number of users grow, you can just throw application servers at it and scale the application tier pretty easily. And so your costs and your performance are fairly linear. But with the data tier, you, ha you, you tend to go up. You tend to scale up uh, quite a bit, which means that your costs and your performance uh, are nonlinear. And, uh, and you get to a point where you might not be able to meet your performance needs. And so with NoSQL and specifically distributed document databases, your database itself scales out. So you can add additional nodes as you go along and your costs as well as your performance tend to stay linear because you, you, as your application grows, you have more users, uh, you just add more nodes, you distribute the data across those nodes so you get additional I.O. as well as additional memory and that's how you serve your application out. And so from a scalability perspective, there's a couple of questions as well. Um, do you co constantly keep upgrading your, your hardware to, to keep going up in terms of number of CPUs or, or, or disk usage and memory and so on? Um, are you re reaching a limit to your read write throughputs? Uh, with some of our customers, we've seen latencies in the microseconds. Uh, in, uh, with, uh, with some customers, throughput is, uh, could reach millions. So you're actually processing uh, a million uh, ops per second reads and writes, um, a mix of them. And, and so if that's what your application needs, then you might want to look at a distributed document database. Yeah. <coughs> I think it depends. In some cases, updates are implemented in place. Uh, and so in that case, you might see a little more disk fragmentation. So you might have to deal with the disk fragmentation issues. But you might have compaction where you, like a reorg uh, that, where, that goes and cleans up your, uh, your data. Uh, you have a Couchbase in version 2.0 we implemented as an append only, and so write is not a problem at all. You're basically, you have very fast drain rates and write rates. So what are some of the other aspects? And the first one is accessing data, and you asked a question about, well, how do I actually interact with the system? Uh, there aren't standards yet. Uh, with relational databases, SQL is, has been around for a while, well-defined language, a uh, lot of extensions to it. Uh, but there isn't a universal way of accessing the, the, these databases. Uh, at the core, you have um, SDKs. So you have client SDKs, which are smart SDKs that actually understand cluster topology uh, that, that give you the, the performance benefit with auto sharding. Uh, in some cases, uh, the, the, uh, your queries are executed over HTTP, and so you might have an HTTP API to query it. Uh, but before you jump in, you might want to make sure that the language that you're implementing your application in is supported uh, for, these, for these databases. With Couchbase, we support uh, uh, C, Ruby, PHP, Java, .NET. And so you have a wide variety of languages to choose from. <laughs> uh, no standards, there's no standard way of accessing all these in the same way, right? So uh, your application might be built for a specific uh, database. You might have to change that if you switch the back end. With Couchbase, we're actually uh, Memcached compatible, 100% compatible. So if you already have a Memcached application that's connecting to it, you could just switch Memcached out with Couchbase. And Memcached is pretty, pretty heavily used um, across the board for uh, OLTP applications. Other than NoSQL, do you use the name Couch? Yes. <laughs> so CouchDB is a, is a is a standalone uh, single server document database uh, which uh, which was which exists and we embed it. Uh, Membase was uh, was a key value store and so if you if you kind of put those together it becomes Couchbase. But Couch by itself is a cluster of um, uh, I think it's underutilized uh, um, d d servers. So distributed servers. So uh, the it's it's commodity hardware. It's a cluster of commodity hardware, which is uh, what it means at the core. 
consistency. Consistency is the other aspect where um, with relational, you have ACID, you expect multi-document transactions, you, uh, you have um, strong uh, atomicity uh, with updates when multiple records are updated and so on. Um, at the moment with Couchbase, um, we have s transactions at a single document level, which is why when you have all your data, related data in a single document for an object, uh, you're atomic. Right, uh, so you write to one location, you read from the same location, and so you're strongly consistent. Uh, but if you want multiple objects to be updated at the same time, inserted at the same time, that's not supported at the moment. Availability, we talked a little bit about high availability. Uh, this is very important, particularly when you're using commodity servers. Uh, your, the quality of hardware uh, may not be as great, and so you need to be able to handle node failures. And so if you have a cluster, you have replication across intra-cluster, and so if a node goes down, you can simply fail over to your replica and keep running the application. And we have, um, uh, you, you can configure the number of replicas. You could have one, two, or three replicas, uh, depending on the size of your cluster. It's, it's actually much, much easier. So what happens is the clusters kind of show up as a, a single instance, and the client SDKs that we support understand the cluster topology. And so when you connect using the clients, the client knows exactly where that key is located via consistent hashing. So, so it manages. So we have a cluster manager. If we get uh, time for it, we, I might uh, go into a little bit more about how that's done. But when the cluster gets, the topology changes, maybe when you add nodes, uh, when you remove nodes, when you rebalance data, uh, you, the, the cluster map and your clients gets updated as well. And so that operation is atomic. And so when, when a node goes down, for example, uh, you start getting, getting uh, not, my, not my data errors. And so the, cl the client knows that, okay, something's changed. It tries to go connect to another node, gets the new cluster topology, the new cluster map, and then goes and connects to the right node. And so that is completely, uh, uh, it's abstracted for the user. Exactly. So is that for Couch you're This is for Couch, the Couch base. Uh, with Mongo, they have another a similar kind of an approach where you have auto sharding. Uh, it's it's not necessarily auto distributed uniformly because it's a not consistent hashing, but it's it's similar. It's uh, the client SDKs uh, take care of it. So it's free hashing instead of uh, replicating. Is that the difference? The replication is is slightly different. So replication is for uh, your uh, high availability, and that happens whether you, you know, how, irrespective of the cluster map. And order. There is replication. So the replication is in the master slave flavor. Uh, where in Couchbase, every node is the same. Every node is e equal, and so it's you just clone them, basically. You just add more nodes. In Mongo, you have a slightly different flavor where you have a master node for the shard and replica nodes. And so every server is either a master or a slave, and then that's how data is replicated. But it doesn't if the master goes down, you, you, the replica will get activated as a new master. And so the question is, is uh, NoSQL the right choice for you if you have requirements for uh, security, encryption, um, a Kerberos support, uh, or, um, complex joins across objects, uh, extreme compression needs, then maybe not, not yet, uh, as I would say uh, for, uh, to the gentleman at the back. Uh, we are uh, f fairly early in the product cycle, and we hope to add features uh, as, as we get demand for them. Uh, but at the, at the moment, there, NoSQL is a great choice for supporting your interactive web ac applications, OLTP applications, where you need very, very high throughput at a, at a low latency at a consistent way. So we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I, I had a session a section here about Couchbase overview, uh, but if there's any questions, I'd like to answer those first. 
Would you like to have a brief overview of Couchbase Server? All right. So I'll try to keep this um, uh, simple and not make it into an advertisement. Uh, but Couchbase is simple, fast, elastic, no SQL. Uh, it embeds a cache, so you don't have uh, problems with managing a separate caching tier. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you have online rebalancing, online upgrades, and maintenance. So your application is always running 24-7. And replication takes care of high availability. So if you have node failures, you can you can keep the application going. A replica will will then take over as the master. Bunch of um, um, customers that we support. Um, Zynga is one of our um, big users. Uh, AOL advertising as well. Uh, we have um, a lot of paid deployments at the moment. But to answer your question about uh, the the couchbase architecture and how it how it actually works each node has two aspects you have the data manager and a cluster manager now the cluster manager is always managing the health of the cluster it's talking to the other nodes trying to see how, whether they're healthy trying to have replication going across rebalancing going across it also manages the ui the ui is uh, is aggregated so every the, if whichever node you you go to it will look exactly the same. It aggregates all the results from across the cluster and, and brings them up for, from a stats and a monitoring perspective. The data manager, on the other hand, manages simple inserts, updates, deletes, uh, querying, and so on. And so each node looks exactly the same, and it looks like this. And so in, in terms of the deployment, you have your web app at the top. You have a client library, which is a smart library. Uh, the library uh, understands what the cluster map looks like because it connects with the cluster managers uh, and knows where data, where each key lives. And so it can directly connect with that server. And the data flow is through to directly to each node. And so if you have a key, uh, the client knows exactly where it lives, connects to that node directly, and gets access to it. And this is uh, an example of how um, we write. Your, your, your question was about uh, writes earlier. What's the speed of writes? Uh, it's incredibly fast because we have um, we have a tiered system. So you have um, you have a RAM tier, uh, which is just your caching tier, as well as your disk tier. And so when a when a request arrives, write this key for me. Uh, it it puts it in there. Next, it's going to send a response back because it's it's just storing it to RAM. It's really fast, saying that yes, I have written it. Quite immediately, it gets replicated to other nodes in the system. So these, so it, this is for durability needs. So you you start sending it out to your other replicas, and then it's also put at the same time into a disk write queue, which actually then persists it on disk. And so this way, you get your uh, high throughput with your writes, you get durability with replication, uh, and you also get persistence by storing it on disk. On a disk, do you have So for the disk, we are, it's CouchDB at the back end. So it, it, CouchDB is, um, uh, it's, an, it's an append system, an append only system, but we actually persist to it. So we have our own persistence layer. Yes, so there is a compaction support. So you have auto compaction or manual compaction, which which triggers every now and then and cleans up old records. Uh, but I mean, if, if, if you That's right. That's, that's right. So we have observe functionality, which is if you really want your data to be um, synchronously written out, you have the option of saying, okay, replicate it first, because replication is really fast, right? It's it's in memory, it's really fast. Replicate it first and then return me the, your response. And so if you don't want an async for, for, if you're creating a new user ID, for example, you want to make sure that it's actually there and it gets persisted, so you have an option to do that. Uh, for But a lot of our users are uh, have data where you don't really need that to be persisted, uh, and you can have multiple replicas that, that are uh, available for durability. Client has a key that knows what the underlying um, shard is. 
Yes. That's right. So let's actually just step through this really quick. Couple, couple more minutes, and uh, and this is the last slide I'll go through uh, and skip through the end. Assume this is where you're, where you're starting off, right? You have three servers. You have a bunch of information on each server, and for each document, you also have a replica on another node, right? Now, so that's that's the replica that's uh, sitting on um, another node. Now you have your application servers, you might have multiple application servers, uh, and you have your couch-based client, which is kind of the smart client that includes the cluster map. And here what happens is you ask for document 5, uh, it, it uses the cluster map, uh, hashes, uh, gets the key, says that, okay, document 5 lives on server 1, that's where I need to connect to, and gets it back. So that's really how, how it works on the, the client to the server layer. Great question. A great question is one where, I, where, where you actually have, have it right there. <laughs> so when you add new additional servers, and you can add multiple servers at the same time. You could add five, 10, it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to do it one at a time. Uh, you want to rebalance out because your demand is increasing. What happens with consistent hashing is the document IDs always hash to a, a, the same number. And so that doesn't really change. What changes is where that, that virtual bucket lives. And so when you rebalance, you start rebalancing out specific V buckets, or as we call them, virtual buckets, to other servers. And the cluster manager knows exactly where those V buckets live. And so the, the, the consistent hashing continues. Nothing, nothing needs to be rehashed. Exactly, exactly. So there is a level of indirection that allows you to do that. And so now it, it tells the, uh, the clients the cluster map has changed. And so now you're going to go to another node and directly access it from there. Uh, failover, this is an interesting case where uh, you're, you're connecting to um, node three here, a server three, uh, and something goes wrong and it goes down. Uh, what happens is if you have auto failover already set up, then your replica documents get promoted to active, and so your virtual v your virtual buckets on your other nodes get pinged and say, "Hey, you're active now. Get get promoted." And the cluster map gets updated, and you then move to the the correct server. So that's how cluster, uh, failover works. And that's right, across the clusters. Yeah, it's like a gossip-like gossip protocol across the clusters. But with that, thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the presentation. <laughs>